we're back. Eric, you've returned. I have. And we're here, of course, to follow up on the Suicide Squad, the smash yeah. hit. <laughs> well, uh, we're not going to. Who I, you talk to? Uh, I don't know. Who are you talking if, to? Uh, if we're if we're talking to uh, the box office, no. If we're talking critically, definitely. Well, lay it on me. What did you think? I wanted big dumb fun, and this was big dumb fun. There's nothing revolutionary about this movie, and that's okay. Uh, it it gave me a lot of bloody kills. It entertained me. Bright colors. It was ever. It was what we talked about. It was Guardians of the Galaxy, but with blood in it. Well, there were there were tropes, as you know, and all that that we can mm-hmm. that we'll, we can break down. But w- the one thing that I I really liked. I mean, there are many things I really liked about the movie because it's everything that was set up paid off in one fashion or another. Uh, what I really loved was the relationship between Bloodsport and his daughter because it was like, oh, this isn't the loving relationship. This is just, fuck you, fuck you, man. Right. And I'm like, oh, okay. This is kind of, I mean, there's still stakes. There's still like, you know, I guess responsibility love involved in it like mm-hmm. she like yeah. he does care but it's not you know the t- there was no touching of the glass and none of that stuff that was uh and i think it was that was a great move on james gunn's part because it was taking to a certain extent the plot of the david uh ayers suicide mm-hmm. squad and just kind of flipping it instead of like oh it's not a loving relationship it's like ah, i never wanted you fuck off yeah i mean he sets the tone right in the opening scene with Michael Rooker um, killing the bird with mm-hmm. the ball. And you're like, oh, okay, uh, that's what this movie's gonna be. And I think, you know, we kind of knew that going in. Um, this really feels like <laughs> the sequence in MacGruber, where of course he recruits his elite team and gets them all together uh, and then puts them in the van with the C4 that he like packed personally and then they just immediately explode and mm-hmm. it's like it's a great gag obviously because it builds up for like five minutes he gets all the team together uh there's a gay panic joke in there that maybe doesn't work anymore but right. uh you know you do everything and then it blows up and it was like oh that was great this was like two hours of that um and <laughs> i think which is good but at the same time it was like it was all about subverting expectations right from from the first mission you know, yeah. it was like setting everything up. Like, here are your main players. There's fucking Boomerang. And it's like, uh-oh, Boomerang's in this, he's in this first mission with these guys who are recognizable faces and like characters. And there's uh, there's Harley Quinn. Like, she's not going to bite it, right? Yeah. Uh, and then immediately, you know, he tries to flip it on its head, which is entertaining uh, for sure. And a lot of fun. I mean, that sequence is really fun. Oh, yeah. And we were dead right about one of the OGs had to go and had to go early. And we were right about oh, Boomerang. Man. I, and, and I, as soon as I saw that, I knew, I knew, I was like, oh, okay, somewhere out there, Steve is giddy as fuck. I literally, I almost took a video of it because it happened and I paused it and I went, yes, and then, you know, <laughs> continued on with the movie. There was actually a comment um, on our last video. Somebody was like, it's funny because they tried to turn the, the Ayer version of Suicide Squad into basically a James Gunn version of Suicide Squad. And then now they've got James Gunn finally gives that version. Um, and it, unfortunately it's like not nearly as successful, but I think artistically like, yeah, it was, it nailed everything that they needed to do. I just yeah. don't think, I think they may have overestimated like, hey, this is gonna appeal to a wide audience. Um, it's it's not, it's for like gore hounds and uh, you know, people who, who want like a fucking crazy comic yeah, book movie. It, Well, it's an uphill battle to begin with anyway, because we just saw a Suicide Squad movie four years ago and it's not great. And that, and I think that the modern audience, uh, you know, there are people that are part of film Twitter or they have YouTube shows and all that, that know everything. <laughs> yeah, that have kind of a deep insight read the Hollywood Reporter, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. But the vast majority of, you know, your random ass folk are like, oh, yeah, I thought I saw this one. Nah, I'm, uh, you know, I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. They, and they just didn't. Did you have a favorite kill? Oh, God. Um, I'm going to say Joel Kinnaman's death because it's the one that had the most 
steaks and it had an actual pause like we literally saw his heart getting Oh, yes, we pierced. did. I know, like an old David and, Fincher movie. It's like we got to go yeah, inside. Yeah. You know. yeah, it was very visceral, and it was uh, the most poignant. You know, we joked earlier. It's like, listen, one of the OGs has to go, and we even said that it's not likely that Colonel Flag would be one of the deaths. But yeah, that that one was the one that emotionally struck. That was probably the only one that did uh, that I really felt a connection to in terms of like, oh, okay, they, you know, they built him up enough that he felt like the most honorable, particularly when he makes the decision, you know, to, to take the drive and like, well, our mission's going to change now. Um, you know, you got a sense of like, oh, okay, this is a person that um, maybe we should be caring about. So yeah, when they, when they kill him, especially the way that, that Cena, John Cena does it, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it was, it was certainly affecting. I, it wasn't the, I know it was like the close up on the heart and stuff. Like I right, didn't think right. it was like the, the best gore kill, but it certainly was the most, as you said, affecting. Then like Peacemaker, I don't know, but Peacemaker, we're going to get eight episodes to find out more about him, but I didn't get a real great grasp on his backstory. Maybe you have a little more insight on that. I'm, but it kind I'm guessing, of... uh, well, uh, when Alan Moore was trying to write Watchmen, he was originally using the question and various other DC slash Charlton characters. And they're like, nah, nah, you got to make up your own. And Peacemaker was one of them. And Peacemaker evolved into the comedian. With that in mind, I kind of thought, okay, well, I don't know the backstory or even the backstory they're inventing for the film. They probably Mm -hmm. could have just ditched the original Peacemaker character and has come up with something on their own. I, I thought it was, um, I thought John Cena did a great job. The lack of the backstory made it unique for me because like, okay, what is it about this guy? Because this whole thing is, I will kill every man, woman, and child to face pe- to, to fight for peace. I'm like, oh my God, he's Captain America, the Punisher. It's and, very, uh, I mean, I, he, would, he would fit in perfectly in the boys, you know, like he's, he's very much an archetype for like, um, for that show and the way that they kind of treat their characters. There's a shorthand um, that they use in this movie. And I'm curious what you think, because I think he purposefully skips backstory or even explaining certain things like Weasel. There is no explanation that I remember. It's literally just like, that's a weasel. That's like a giant yep. kind of man looking weasel. And it just exists in this world. And like, yep. you just have to accept that going in. And so a lot of that is kind of good because it's like, yeah, we don't have to spend time talking about like, well, they did these experiments on this person and a weasel and now he's this way. It's like, no, no, look, there's a guy who's like a weasel. Great, okay, mm-hmm. move on. I think the Cena one maybe the peacemaker, like you, they gave just enough for you to understand where he was coming from, uh, at least his worldview. A lot of my intrigue with the Peacemaker character has a lot to do with the performance of John Cena because he's delivering lines just saying, God damn it, now I have to kill you. And he's like, mm-hmm. you don't have to. And that's the and that's the cool thing is that he does these sudden, like yeah, we were talking about wrestling before he got in the air, but that but I guarantee one of the things he learned from it was facial muscles and facial acting because you could see kind of this conflict in his face as he is killing Joel Kinnaman, as he's trying to kill Ratcatcher 2, of which he's trying to pause. But the thing of it is, is you don't know if he's pausing because he has to bring up like this, this sense of duty or because he's trying to hide the fact he secretly likes killing. I do think the performance is great. Um, it's funny, and but also like terrifying in a way. Um, and again, it's like, even though he played a villain in F9, yeah, it wasn't like this. Like this was, you know, this yeah. was a true asshole. He pretty much was, I mean, it's like, okay, yeah, we had uh, Starro as like the, I guess the, the like de facto big bad, but really wasn't, it was almost an afterthought. It was just like, there's a thing that eventually we're going to have to stop. But it was more about that, obviously, team dynamic. And he was probably the, the biggest villain um, out of all of them. Because even like the thinker, oh, yeah was kind of just a uh, a bit of a MacGuffin he, to get you to the next part. He was a means story. to an end. Yeah. 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 And he was okay. And, I gotta I gotta say, I know we talked to Peter Capaldi like, woo, we love him, but 
I felt like the character was it's okay. It wasn't anything. It's fine. The, yeah. I think they just told him, they just put some things on him and said, just say things and uh, yeah. here's your check. Have a good, nice flight back to the UK. I think, yes. And that works for me. And it's, yeah. and it's fine. I mean, I thought going into it, like this guy's going to be like a mastermind. He's going to be out thinking everybody. And it was basically just like, hey, you're going to take us to this thing. And he's like, I don't know. Okay, I'll do it. And then he delivers the big, the big, bombshell that we kind of all knew that was coming. It's like the United States was responsible for the Starro program. Right. Project Starfish. Well, let's talk about King Shark. Uh, meet your new group. Groups of wow. shark now. <laughs> Pretty and, much. I mean, a deep, a deep voice, mostly actor voices him. We're unsure of the amount of intelligence uh, mm -hmm. the character has. Uh, very toyetic. I can see uh, I can, I can see Oh God! Someone's gonna do a baby king shark, aren't they? Oh yeah, and like the Stallone thing is kind of like in hindsight very obvious for casting, but uh, yeah, because it worked, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> if we want to talk about detachable kid, it was again, it's like set up for one gag, and oh yeah, Nathan Fillion showed up, did his job, and said thank you. I don't know if it's a thing where the subverting of expectations. I knew going in that that's what this movie would be. And so I don't know if the idea of the movie subverting expectations is more powerful than the movie subverting expectations, if that makes any sense. It's like, I knew that they would be taking lefts when they should be taking right. So it, some of that stuff wasn't as surprising, but it was fun to see how they got there. It was like, yeah. on that first mission, I had a very strong feeling, even though it was like, well, maybe, you know, Harley Quinn, a very strong feeling that things were going to go wrong and that you could sense that like, even in our conversation before where it's like, yeah, Nathan Fillion is there purely to die. We know, yeah. right. That's yeah. coming. So like when he detaches his arms and then they send him out and he just kind of does a little slap, it's like funny in the moment. But then afterwards I'm like, yeah, I don't know. That's kind of what I, it's almost what I envisioned it being, even though it was supposed to be a subversion of the expectation. They needed a little bit of that heart, um, which you kind of got with Flag, but it kind of felt like you needed those moments to anchor it because it was it yeah. was so outrageous in moments. And so just like, hey, here's this thing we're setting up. And then we destroy that thing. Ha ha ha, wasn't that but fun? There was, Let's move on. But with every one of that, there was also set up for something greater. Like Javelin's death meant something in the end. Right. Yes. Because it did. he gives he gives the javelin to Harley Quinn, who uses it to kill Starro. So yes. Now it's not like I like I said before, not earth shattering storytelling, but well done storytelling admits a lot of the subversions. Because there was a uh, Viola Davis saying, mm -hmm. "I'm going to make a leader out of you," and boom, he does. And uh, mm -hmm. Taika Waititi was great as Rat Catcher One. I found that to be a very, like, there's there's some actual heart in this, like you were mentioning before. And it had to be there. Otherwise, it would be harder to root for these characters. It's yeah. really, it was really cool. And it, and again, it paid off. Everything right. did. Every, all the little stuff did. It, they even paid off the whole thing about uh, the difference between uh, Bloodsport and Peacemaker. The fact that they are identically the same, but Peacemaker said, well, I'll use smaller bullets. And it won't even touch the sides. And that's how he gets taken down. Right. Was right. because Bloodsport had smaller bullets. Yeah. So. In terms of the setups and payoffs, and like, you know, there's the whole raid to save Flag and the entire sequence of they just murder so many people um, in very creative, fun ways. Uh, and then for the punchline to come. And again, that was a sequence that I could see coming. I kind of knew yeah. like they are going to get to that point and then this is going to be, you know, uh, they killed all the wrong people and it happened. And I, but I still was like, well, they did it so well. And like yeah. the, the Cena, uh, Idris Elba, like back and forth in that sequence is so great um, that it, it all worked, even yeah. though I kind of like, you could see, I could see the machinery moving oh, yeah. and where yeah. they were going. It didn't you know matter what? because- Steve, do you know why? Because it's dope what? as fuck. Right? Yeah, it's great. It's great. That made me laugh and like made the whole sequence worth it. Yeah. Polka Dot Man. 
We yeah. gotta talk about Polka Dot Man. We have to talk about Polka Dot Man. We had him going far, but I think we he probably died where we thought he would. Yeah. The odds maybe were like 400 to one that he would survive. <laughs> that was a, such a, a really fun, interesting, unique superhero um, who had an arc that paid off and the gags that they used to get him there were a lot of fun. I mean, you know, having kind of the mom complex and all that stuff was just great. He's a great character. He's a great character actor. Yeah. Um, and that felt like one of those, like, you needed that character to be in the movie and to have that arc and to get killed the way he did. Um, yeah. It felt because like the story's that was over. Important. Yes. Yeah. His story's over. He was bred he to be everything. a superhero uh, and he wanted revenge against his mom and he got, he got both wishes. He got, so. Yeah, he got it all. Kind of hand in hand with that is the sequence with Milton, if you recall, um, <laughs> which is that extended conversation. Now, again, I noticed that he was with them that for that whole run and then nobody talked to him he was just around. It was a great choice. The way they framed the shots, the way he was like a part of the mission and just long enough in some of those shots for you to go like, is that guy supposed to be, you know? And then they cut yeah, yeah. and they keep going. And then he dies. I think it was Polka Dot Man who's the only person who's like, who, Milton. Who remembers you know? his name, which is weird because I I watched the I watched the movie twice. Uh, yeah. And I, I wondered to myself, okay, before the Milton sequence, did, did we actually hear his name? And we do. And Bloodsport is the one that knocks on the window to the van and says, hey, you Milton? Really? And, oh, yeah. Okay. And, and then he, and he's scared to go, see? And I'm like, oh, yeah. it's, it sounds like such a fucking throwaway line. And then again, set up payoff. All of that adds up to like a movie that did feel satisfying, even if again, like a lot of the stuff it's built, the, the whole thing's built on, like these people are all gonna die. So like, yeah. don't get too attached, right? Um, so it's kind of easy to call like, yeah, well, I think all these people are gonna get killed or that's gonna happen. And I know what's gonna happen in this movie, um, but it's not really built for that. It's not built to surprise you in those ways. It's built to surprise you when you care about the person that's yes. about to die. Right, because they very clearly are like, none of these people are worth caring about. Right? Yeah, They're yeah. all set up to be, to be killed. Even even fucking Starro kind of had a bit of an emotional moment. He did, I know. In well, the face of the general, he's like, I, I was floating, staring at the stars, and I was happy. And I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. Oh, well, oh you, you poor interdimensional freak creature. Especially when you're, when you're telling a story, you're writing, it's like, all you got to do is flip the point of view. And suddenly, like, yeah, if you think about it, that's kind of an innocent. He's just innocent, hanging in space right? and then yeah. astronauts kidnapped him. Right. <laughs> so like, well, of course he's pissed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'd be mad too. <laughs> we haven't even talked about Harley Quinn, which yeah. we probably should. We should. Because <laughs> uh, she's in this movie. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think Margot Robbie has the character down. I oh, think yeah. it's a lot of fun. I didn't love the extended sequence of her kind of being asked to get married and all that stuff. Again, yeah. I like the payoff of it. I mean, just from a like story standpoint, I, I didn't quite understand the leap from like, well, we're going to kill these people. Now they know she's here. And then they, he brings her in and is like, I want to marry you. Like if that felt like a very thin justification to get where they wanted to go yeah they capture her and she gets tortured and you know it's like do we need to see that happen to her again i think she's done that I, right yeah i mean the problem with the harley quinn character goes all the way back to when she was first conceived in batman the animated series was oh no she's a um her character was just a warning it's like this is what happens to mm -hmm. people that are in abusive relationships yeah she was conceived as a cautionary tale and then gained in popularity and now she's seen as this person that rose above that but uh a lot of people want to regress her back to that mm -hmm. and not move her forward she ends up being in a damsel in distress uh yeah. now granted she's a damsel in distress that 
escapes herself and that's part of the gag but yeah. it's all still it's all look it's still even you're even if you're subverting that trope you're feeding into that trope so much this movie has a ton of great sequences the sequence where she's going down the hall i don't know what it is you're seeing like the inside of her mind or something but essentially it's like the moment with the flowers and everything i actually kind of wish they he went further with that visual type of style because like you see it there and sometimes in like uh, little title cards or like they're telling you what their location is and it's those visual choices felt really unique for me it was almost like a, eh, it's a little few and far between the fight between peacemaker and, and rick flag where half of it is just in the helmet yeah. right and I it's like oh. it's just like a it's something it reminds me of the beginning of guardians of the galaxy 2 um where it's kind of like they're fighting off screen. Like it's literally like, you don't see what's going on, but people are kind of just getting sent back into frame. But it it works because it feels different, right? Cause like we've yeah. seen fights of every kind. So like that stuff was really cool. You had it right at the beginning of this. You had it right in our video before. Apparently you're always right, but- <laughs> the... <laughs> Let's not get crazy now. <laughs> but big dumb fun is exactly what this was with moments of brief sparks of emotion and heart, not enough to like dip into anything melodramatic or make it feel like they were forcing this on you where you, you know, it was like, oh, no, no eye rolling moments to me. Uh, the gore was incredibly over the top, extremely violent, pretty rare to see in a $185 million movie. Uh, you know, people have been calling it like a big budget trauma film. I can't believe that's true. And also it exists. It's hard to complain about that. And the fact that the movie got made and it's like probably very true to James Gunn's vision of what he wanted to make. I know he's trying to, uh, you know, subvert certain expectations, but you know, okay, we've got this big Watchmen style villain at the end. That's just kind of there to be the MacGuffin, to bring the team together. And that's fine. Um, but he found interesting ways to do action sequences, uh, like we talked about with the fight in the, the helmet of Peacemaker. And yeah, I would watch this again. Uh, I would recommend it to people. I'm not a huge DC movie guy, but like this one, I totally bought into it and, and had a lot of fun. Cena was definitely the standout. I will watch Peacemaker. Um, and yeah, overall, it's a pretty good movie. Yeah, you nerd approved. Put, nerd it on the, appro put it on the screen. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, and what did you think? You know, it is James Gunn's vision, but you know he has to compromise here and there because these aren't his. Uh, these aren't his characters. Uh, this isn't his giant movie franchise. It's not his IP. All these other things he has to answer to DC, he has to answer to Warner Brothers, he has to answer to the ratings board, he has to answer to the actor's contracts. There's so many things that, that, that he has to answer to that the impressive thing is that he was able to dance up between all those cracks and not fall in. It's just a fun way to kill two and a half hours. Uh, don't bring your kids. There's dong oh. in it. Don't bring it. Uh, <laughs> oh, so is it Eric approved or Barnes approved? What's the, is the barn door open? <laughs> the barn door is open. Uh, look, I added a graphic too. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can't see it, but it's there. Oh, man. But you know you, what? I could totally subvert the expectations and nothing Ooh, Maybe you can. I'll f I won't find out until, uh, maybe I should subscribe to Sticky Floor Friday uh, oh. at, at Nerd With Words. Uh, to see if you've subverted my expectations. Very nice. Or you might tweet at me using your name at Eric uh -huh. W. Barnes. That's correct. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. you will, of course, be tweeting to me at Nerd with Words mm -hmm. and my, you know, very small following because I don't enjoy tweeting. Well, thank you. Uh, this is a lot of fun. It was fun doing these two episodes with you. It's good to talk with you. Yeah. Um, I hope you're staying safe and uh, let's find another movie that we can talk about coming up here. Hell yeah, man. I'm all for it. Awesome.